All right. So my name is Stefan. I'm from the University of Pennsylvania, presenting on some work that I've done with Dr. Baker, also at Penn, Mia Almeda and Alex Bowers at Teachers College, and Neil Heffernan at Worcester Polytechnic Institute. Uh, I want to talk about correlational topic modeling for automated topic identification and intelligent tutoring systems. Thanks to some uh, very astute observations from our reviewers who suggested we start with a discussion of what intelligent tutoring system is. Uh, intelligent tutoring systems are widely used educational tools. They are used by hundreds of thousands of students across the nation and across the globe. They are personalized, data-driven approaches to and assessments of student learning. Within these intelligent tutoring systems, we have structures called domain models. Uh, when you have content in an intelligent tutoring system, questions, problems that students are working through, we arrange those into knowledge components, or KCs. And these KCs describe the skill or skills that are associated with particular problems. So this process of domain modeling, which is assembling the correct knowledge component item mapping, is crucial for success within ITS environments, because the structure of the domain model underlies our understanding of how students learn, perform, and develop their knowledge within these systems. There's a few existing approaches to how we can map these KCs to these individual problems, how we can construct these domain models. Uh, we can use expert content creation and coding through curriculum development. We can use crowdsourced tagging and metadata from teachers, instructors, and other users of the system. And there's also some analytical approaches that we can use as well. Um, but all of these approaches have uh, certain shortcomings or deficiencies associated with them. Uh, expert content creation is costly, it doesn't scale very well, uh, it's a very time-consuming process. Crowdsource tagging and metadata is very scalable, but you're subject to uh, inaccuracies in teacher coding or you're subject to just having teachers who uh, don't have the time to tag their programs appropriately or their uh, problems appropriately, so you just have no information on them. And uh, the analytical approaches primarily use information on student performance to generate these mappings under the assumption that within these given cases, item difficulty is going to be relatively homogenous, but we run into issues of tautology when we want to go and actually understand how students learn in these programs because we have uh, fit a domain model to student performance, and then if we want to go and use something like knowledge inference, like Bayesian knowledge tracing, uh, we're using student performance again. So we're almost certainly going to wind up with a, uh, an overfit and subtly inaccurate model in that case. What we propose doing is using natural language processing to develop domain models, uh, specifically using correlational topic models. These are models that use the semantic content of problems as data. So rather than looking at student performance, we're actually looking at the content of the authored problems themselves. They're fairly easy to deploy at scale with a couple caveats that we'll get to in a bit. They can make classifications for new problems based on an existing domain model. So if we build a domain model and we have a teacher write a couple new questions, it's very easy to categorize those into the existing bins that we have. And they require no student data to generate. Since we're not using student performance, we don't have to uh, sacrifice any student data for the sake of constructing our domain model. We use the Assistance Intelligent Tutoring System to perform this modeling. Uh, it's particularly well suited for this uh, particular form of domain modeling because it is a system that uses teacher-authored problem content. So we have different teachers at different schools who are writing their own content for assistance, authoring their own problems. And we used, in particular, the 2012-2013 data set after processing, cleaning, uh, removing strange problems, we were left with 112,526 items on which to fit our CTM domain model. So some problems and assessments do have skill tagging. Some teachers and some contact experts have taken the time to appropriately tag uh, the KC associated with a given problem. So this is an example of a equation solving more than two steps problem. And I've highlighted here the HTML tags and the special ASCII characters that we're dealing with and the raw unprocessed data, and I'll get to why those are important in just a little bit. And then this is an example of a problem that's tagged as a proportion problem. So when making tea, you use 13 spoons of sugar for every two quarts of tea. Which of the following equations can be used to calculate C, the number of spoons of sugar? You go and C, you select your answer from a multiple choice box. So within assessments, we have 51,026 problems that have skill IDs, but we have almost 129,000 that don't. So for roughly 70% of the problems that have been authored for assessments, we don't have any clear inclination on what those problems are actually about, which is problematic when we want to describe what students are learning to ourselves and to teachers and to the students themselves. So we need a technique that can give us information in an accurate and scalable way on those 129,000 problems that we don't know much about. So that's what we're going to use CTM for. 
But before we can apply the model, we've got a couple special cases that we have to work through. Uh, first of all, we needed to recode mathematical terms and expressions. We're primarily looking at math content here because assistance is a mathematics tutor, but correlational topic models and most natural language processing models in general don't have great ways of dealing with numeric structure. Things like fractions, decimals, equations. So a, a CTM model will take a decimal like 3.75 and consider that to be completely distinct from a decimal like 6.21, when in reality we might want to have some way of understanding that these two numeric expressions are emblematic of this same concept, this concept of being a decimal. And the same argument applies for fractions, things like dollar amounts, equations, variable use, and so on and so forth. So as a way of capturing those, those sources of variance, and they're significant sources of variance in this data set, uh, we wrote a handful of regular expressions and then recoded them into semantic labels. So we wrote a regular expression that captured our idea of what a fraction is, and then we recoded that semantically as xx frac xx. That's not a semantic tag that's going to appear anywhere else in this data. No teacher is writing problems that have xx frac xx in them. So we can identify quickly and easily where these instances of recoding have happened, but also allow them to contribute to the correlational topic model itself. We also needed to strip out HTML tags, things like the paragraph tag, bold tag, strong tags, italicized. But we were able to leave the ASCII characters and Unicode markers in, those ampersand characters, things like ampersand decimal is the character string for actual decimal notation, little dot above an angle or a temperature. Um, this is the first time in two years of working on this project that I've actually been happy to see ASCII characters and have not had to deal with them in some special and corner case way. So it was quite nice that they translate really nicely into this semantic model. So this is an example of what a problem might look like before processing. We've got our HTML tags in blue. Those all need to get ripped out. We've got our special ASCII characters in pink or salmon. Uh, some of those need to go non-breaking spaces we don't particularly care about, but we can also recode and degrees into our semantic tag for XX degrees. So between these two, we've taken this negative 20 degrees Celsius and we've transformed it into X degrees XXC. We didn't capture temperature quite at this point. That was a little difficult to work around, but we can definitely capture this negative 20 degrees emblem, this semantic meaning, and we can recode it into something that the model can actually grasp onto. So these are the regular expressions that we ended up using. Uh, don't worry about taking pictures of this or writing it down. You can just send me an email afterwards and I'll explain them to you. Um, the important thing to note is that we applied them in decreasing order of complexity. So we'd apply things like dollar amounts, percents, and fractions first, and then we'd gradually work our way down to simpler and simpler recodings such that we weren't left with dealing, something, dealing with something like, you know, XX, single digit XX, dot XX, multi-digit XX, when we're trying to figure out just what a decimal is. It made sense to go from most complex and work our way down so that we saved ourselves a bit of headache. So for the modeling approach itself, we used an iterative modeling approach where we assumed one latent topic, then we assumed two latent topics, then we assumed three latent topics, and we assessed perplexity scores between those models as our measure of uh, relational goodness to one another. So perplexity scores are roughly similar to something like a Bayesian information criteria or a Cohen's Kappa when we're, Cohen's Kappa when we're doing other modeling. It's the degree to which a model is able to successfully predict word usage in a left out test set. So a lower perplexity score is going to be indicative of higher predictive capacity and better overall model fit. So you can see as we go from five to 15 to 25, we have this gradually decreasing perplexity score, which suggests that adding more topics into our model is doing a better job of increasing the predictive accuracy of the correlational topic model that we're trying to fit to this data. And uh, 25 is almost certainly not the point at which we should stop. It's the point at which computationally we were forced to stop. Um, assistance has at least 190 skill tags if you go by just what is semantically meaningful, and there could be as many as 450. So this is definitely not the end point for this model. As far as the results in the K equals 25 model, which is the one we chose to interpret, we found three broad types of topics that showed up within the model itself. We found uh, topics that we defined as true knowledge components, so they seem to be things that were emblematic of 
what we would term as a skill, things that had to do with content, things that had to do with numerics and different fields of mathematics. We also found reminder and scaffolding types of topics and system guidance topics. And then I've got counts of what showed up at the bottom. So by and large, we're finding true knowledge components, which is great, that's what we want to see. But then we've also got some of this extra stuff coming in. And so we'll work through some of what these different topics look like. So for the true knowledge component topics, we had things like topic 12, A versus B comparison problems, topic 13, currency problems. And these are all labels that I applied to the data. This isn't something I got from the model. Uh, I went and looked at problems that were associated with this tag, looked for commonalities, figured out what they were talking about. And CTM sells you the words that are most associated with these different topics. So topic 12 is characterized by problems that include words like best, choose, follow, part, and two. Currency problems are described by the money amount semantic tag, as well as number, cost, answer, and total. This is an example of one of the problems that was tagged as topic 12. It's a problem about a research group coming up with different plans to develop a shopping center, and then the student has to describe the sampling method that was used. This is a problem associated with topic 13, write an equation and solve, where we're dealing with dollar figures between you and your sister, and you have to find where you're going to have the same amount of money. Those were the true KC style of questions that we got. We also got these reminder and scaffolding topics, which mostly appeared to be linked to teachers adding in content that reminded students to format answers in specific ways. So topic 17 was how to enter fractions. Uh, associated with answer, make, type, fraction, and enter. And topic 11 was associated with rounding answers, nearest, round, place, answer, and hundredth. So these are some examples of problems that were tagged as entering fractions. And I've bolded and oranged the portion that the model really latched onto. So we've got these reminders like type your answer as a fraction, write your answer as a fraction if needed. The model's latching onto that and characterizing that. And then rounding answers, round to the nearest tenths, round to the nearest hundredths. And then for system guidance topics, these were things that appeared to be system generated messages or meta messages about a student's performance and actions within the system. Things like topic two, you have blank attempts left. Uh, topic 25, future instructions. These are some examples of those. You have two attempts left, you have no attempts left. And then also questions about what's coming up in the future and how to answer these future problems. So in conclusion, we found that correlational topic modeling can identify these textual features that appear together within assistance problems. These features were not just skills, as we were hoping, but also common phrasings, scaffoldings that appear in the systems, not things that we'd really characterize as true knowledge components, just more textual features of the problems that we examined. We do appear to have a pretty high capacity to discriminate between skills. Uh, we found topic seven was characterized as mixed and improper fractions and mostly dealt with those, whereas topic 19 uh, was more concerned with whole fractions and had problems that are involving working with whole fractions. Some limitations are that this is quite computationally intense. The k equals 25 model took me about two and a half days to fit, and that was about the point where I thought it was good enough for submission and just started writing it up. In the future, it would be really nice to ship this off to Amazon Web Services because assistance has anywhere from four to 20 times as many topics as we're currently modeling, and I'm sure that there's some more granularity in there that we could be teasing out. There's also extensive recoding required to deal with mathematical expressions and equations. Uh, the regular expressions that I showed you are just a very small portion of what we could actually do here. There's multiple hundreds of regular expressions that we could write to capture the numerical data that's contained in a mathematics tutor. And uh, there's not a whole lot of work that's been done on that so far. So if you are interested in writing regular expressions and you want to see more granularity, please, please help me. I would really appreciate it. Um, some future directions for this, though, is it, it appears to be pretty promising based on what we've done so far. Uh, we want to evaluate the domain model goodness. We want to know, you know, is this model any better at uh, mapping and understanding student learning uh, compared to something like, you know, Bayesian knowledge tracing on the existing skill model that sits within assessments? Uh, it may, we might be able to use this to filter scaffold and reminder topics to just get them out of the way so that we can focus on distilling these domain models. So maybe using these topics as a means of identifying problems that have that reminder text and then stripping it from future output. Or using these topics towards feature engineering. It might be valuable to know uh, is student performance differential on these problems where they're reminded how to format fractions and reminded how many significant figures they should be using versus problems where they aren't. Uh, increasing the computational power to ensure that we obtain the best fitting number of latent topics, 
or possibly as, a, uh, as an orthogonal to that, considering the potential for skill topic hierarchies or different granularity among the skills. So if we fit a single latent topic on a mathematics tutor, that should be mathematics problems by definition. And as we drill down further and further and we increase the number of topics higher and higher, we should start to see topics like fractions come up, and then as we increase the number of topics further, we should see that differentiate into whole fractions, mixed fractions, improper fractions. So there should be a natural granularity to the topology of skills, and we could use this approach by varying the number of topics we're estimating to start to understand that topology and start to understand the hierarchy of skills. Some future directions for you or your colleagues, potentially. Uh, our lab is looking for a postdoc. If you'd come and like to have fun in sunny Philadelphia and check out Americans inability to manufacture bells or pose with a fantastic Rocky statue, these silhouettes, they could all be you. Um, if you're interested, shoot an email to Ryan Baker at ryanshawnbaker at gmail.com, or if you can't remember that one, you can shoot an email to me and I will make sure that he hears about it. If you're not interested in the postdoc but you'd like to hear more about this research or other things that I'm doing, here's some various other social media links as well as a picture of my face if you need that. I'm not particularly good at faces, but maybe some of you are. Um, and I will open the floor to questions that people might have. Yeah. Uh, did you try using a GPU acceleration to improve the performance of the calculation? I did not. This MacBook right here in front of me is the tool that I use to do this. I'm sure my desktop could do it slightly faster, but I mean, we're approaching a point where this model is either just going to be big enough to fit on whatever Intel ships with my Air, or it needs to go to cloud services. We're talking 10, 20 orders of magnitude larger. Other questions? Oh, yeah. Um, I was just wondering, so you, you talked towards the end about uh, how you thought you might be able to get more specific uh, topics by using uh, a higher K in your topic modeling. Mm -hmm. And so I was just wondering if you did any efforts to actually measure how much um, both the topics themselves were semantically coherent and how well that may or may not have aligned with the labels that existed in the background system, since I know this is not always mm -hmm. the case with topic modeling, depending on how you're doing the... Uh, right. The I did not, and that would be the natural next direction is, you know, I, I think it's going to be difficult to use an automated approach there because different topics are going to have different granularities and different cohesions among themselves. So really, I'm not entirely sure how to answer that question yet, but it's definitely the next logical approach to take here in terms of understanding that. So, so there, are, there are some statistical approaches for measuring coherence. Sure. All, Can you, would, I would love to see them in an email yeah, if yeah. you want to send it to me. I'm just going to ask a question. Did, did those um, categories overlap? Are you taking more than one, is it, or is it just one category per unit? So I believe the output for CTM provides you with the most likely uh, topic, but it also gives you that in terms of the probabilities associated with each topic. So if we have a topic that you know, is tagged as topic 12, but it has a lot of overlap, like some of those system reminder messages probably do because there's other mathematics content in there. We can actually drill down into the relative probabilities and the weights associated with each topic mapped onto that problem to look at which other problems were structurally similar, similar to it or whether it was just an outlier and it was very strongly tagged as itself and not as anything else. Um. I open it up now also to questions to any of the other speakers, uh, to Laura or Yi. And if we're just all ready for lunch, then we can do that. <laughs> Let me thank all the speakers.